On a summer morning in July, Steve Vogelsang walked into a branch of the Royal Bank in Regina, British Columbia with a fake bomb strapped to his chest. Vogelsang slipped a note to the bank teller saying, give this man $50,000. Tears welled in his eyes as he told the teller that someone was holding his grandson hostage and whispered, please help me. The woman behind the counter put down $400 in $20 bills, all she had in her desk. By the time police arrived, Vogelsang was far gone. According to the Globe and Mail, he was so freaked out by the experience that he left the bank without even taking the money. It was his first heist, but it wouldn't be his last. You would think that Vogelsang would be the last person to ever desperately need money. At the peak of his career, he had a car allowance, golf membership, wardrobe curated by Harry Rosen, free haircuts, and lots of other celebrity perks. He hosted charitable events, was a valued board member of the Humane Society, Winnipeg Harvest, and Winnipeg Symphony. Huge billboards with Vogelsang's face appeared all over Winnipeg. He was a true city celebrity. He began his broadcasting career in Prince Albert in 1989 and moved to Winnipeg in 1992. In the 1990s, he was one of the most recognizable faces in Manitoba as a long-loved broadcaster. He covered sports on CTV's Evening News, then he became the head of the newsroom. His co-workers thought of Vogelsang as a true talent who always nailed it on the first cut. He never read from a script and always brought a sense of humor to the set. He had a good heart and didn't shy away from making jokes about the athletes. Vogelsang changed the tone of TV news. Though reporters were pretty strict and formal, he wasn't afraid to say provocative or offensive things. His plays of the week was often a highlight reel of the worst player performances with NHL athletes falling on the ice or shooting goals into their own nets. He catered his content to everyone, not just extreme sports fans, unlike many other sportscasters on the air. Some of his most famous pieces centered on a one-handed quarterback and a concert pianist who doubled as a setter for the national volleyball team. He focused on the stories behind the players, not just the sports games themselves. In 1995, the Jets left Winnipeg for Phoenix, so a lot of the excitement of local sports disappeared with them. Vogelsang shifted his career into upper management as the news director for CTV Winnipeg. But in that position, he found his creativity was stunted and only provided admin support and resources to his employees. It was still before the big internet boom, but Vogelsang still knew that television news was on a slow decline. Vogelsang saw the writing on the wall and decided to jump ship. In 2002, he became a faculty member at Red River College's new campus in the Winnipeg Exchange District. By the age of 39, the Saskatoon native was running one of the country's top broadcasting programs. Many future broadcasters cited Vogelsang for their success. He was a popular instructor, taking great care to remember each student's name and get to know all of them individually. He kept in touch with his former students, coached them on their careers, and networked on their behalf. One student called him, quote, the most inspirational teacher I've ever had. Another said a reference from Steve Vogelsang was like a golden ticket. But Vogelsang was harboring a deep secret. Nine years later, after starting his position at Red River College, Vogelsang saw himself as falling out of touch with the journalism industry he once knew so well. So when Laura, his wife of 20 years, received a job opportunity in Nelson, British Columbia, where they had a retirement home, Vogelsang decided to go with her. He thought he could teach communications at the local community college. As a couple without children, heading into their retirement years, Vogelsang was ready to make enjoying life his priority. When he announced he was retiring from Red River College, the hashtag Steve Don't Leave trended on Twitter. 300 people attended his Steve Apalooza farewell party, complete with a band and a Hummer limo for his family. His close friends flew in from across the country for the event. So going from being a Winnipeg celebrity to a Nelson nobody wasn't easy for Vogelsang. In three years, he applied for 50 jobs and got one, a three-month teaching contract. Desperate for income and something to do, he briefly worked at a Toyota dealership before his worsening depression made it too hard to get out of bed and go to work in the morning. Vogelsang,
Wang was no stranger to depression, but he made Laura promise not to tell anyone about his struggles with mental health. He didn't want anyone to see past the smart, funny, charming man people saw on TV. Even his closest friends had no idea. Vogelsang started taking antidepressants in 2008, but he felt so good that he decided he no longer needed them. He saw leaving Winnipeg as the perfect time to make the change to going medication-free. But a few months later, he suffered what he called a complete emotional collapse. He spent his days sleeping and watching TV. He hardly ever even changed his clothes. Laura encouraged him to take small steps to fight the depression by washing the dishes or taking their dog for a walk. But he just wanted to go back to sleep. In 2014, Vogelsang received a job offer to be the vice president of the Jets' parent company, True North Sports and Entertainment. He and Laura moved back to Winnipeg. It seemed like things were finally starting to turn around. But the job didn't work out. Vogelsang didn't have HR experience and quit before they had the chance to fire him. He felt like a failure. In addition to those three depression-riddled years in Nelson, Vogelsang was at his wit's end. He engaged with the dark secret he thought he left behind three years ago. He was having an affair with one of his former students at Red River College. They began an on-and-off relationship that lasted for years. Now back in Winnipeg, they reconnected. In May of 2015, a full year after the thought initially crossed his mind, Vogelsang told Laura he was leaving her. He packed his things while Laura was at work and practiced his speech through tears. He told her that he changed, but didn't mention the affair because he thought it would just make her more upset. Laura, who thought she was coming home to a couple's dinner at their favorite restaurant, was completely shocked to see Vogelsang's things packed in a truck. She never learned about the affair from him and only found out in the Winnipeg Free Press many months later. Vogelsang's career and marriage weren't the only things hitting rock bottom. His finances were also a mess. He and Laura lost 80 $5,000 on the sale of three properties they owned in Nelson. Upon their return to Winnipeg, they entered a high bid for a home they wanted in the city's upscale neighborhood of River Heights. When they tried to sell it for what they paid for it two years later, no one was interested. Vogelsang owed more on the mortgage than the house was worth. He didn't want to accept the loss and waited a few more months hoping a buyer would come through. He went back to teaching on a contract at Red River College, but it still wasn't enough to cover the $3,200 per month mortgage. By 2016, he was lost in his mounting depression. The debts were getting higher. His friends didn't stand by him during the divorce. He was gaining weight. He stopped answering the phone and his behavior became increasingly unstable and bitter. He was cruel towards his ex-wife and became emotionally abusive. Laura felt like she lost the man she once married. His relationship with his former student also started declining. It ended badly in 2016 with the woman filing a restraining order against him. Vogel saying violated the order three times. His ex-girlfriend told the judge she didn't know who he was anymore. As if it couldn't get any worse, a week before the fall semester in fall 2017, Vogelsang received word that his teaching contract was not renewed at Red River College. He had nothing left. He had to borrow $10,000 from a friend, $2,000 from an uncle, and $2,000 from a college roommate. But with $15,000 in credit card debt, he hardly saw a way out. He resorted to eating rice and beans that he bought wholesale. By October, his home faced foreclosure, but he was desperate to maintain his reputation. Vogelsang had an idea. Rob a bank. He thought that this was the perfect way to clear his debts while taking money from an institution rather than a person. In his mind, robbing banks didn't hurt anyone and would only help the situation. His first heist took place at a bank in Regina. It was the farthest branch from the city police station, which would give him extra time to escape. While he came into that bank with a fake bomb strapped to his chest, he decided to let go of that idea in future heists. The story he used, though, stayed roughly the same. He always chose a bank on the edge of a city and parked his car near a park. He tried to conduct the heist towards the end of the day when there were fewer people in the branch. He gave the teller a note asking for $2,500. He thought this was the perfect amount to request, hoping the teller would be able to find the money quickly and not tell anyone. Unlike TV bank robberies, Vogelsang never ran away from the crime. He got his cash and walked leisurely back to his car, throwing his jacket and sweatpants into the garbage and continued in the jeans and blazer he was wearing underneath. One time, he walked into a nearby bar just to watch the drama unfold between the police and the bank while he ordered a drink. Vogelsang was finally able to support himself, and he was getting confident in his bank robbing skills. A bit too confident. On the evening of October 20th, 2017, he made the incriminating decision to park his car in Royal Bank's empty parking lot. He was feeling lazy and didn't want to walk all the way back to his car like he usually did. After leaving the bank with 
$1,000 in hand, a woman drove into the bank's parking lot just as Vogelsang was driving out. She remembered what his car looked like, a red truck with a black top, and was able to describe it to the police later. The next day, police found Vogelsang's truck behind the Medicine Hat Lodge where he was staying in the jacuzzi room. On October 21st, at 3 in the morning, he answered a call from the front desk telling him to head downstairs immediately because the carbon monoxide alarm was going off. He had a hunch that his crime spree was over. As soon as he opened the front door of his motel room, three armed officers surrounded him. Nine others yelled, freeze, and told him to get on the ground. He began to kneel down when an officer punched him in the kidneys, causing him to fall forward and lay face down into the carpet. He wasn't scared, he was relieved. It was finally over. His lawyer, Greg White, made excuses. He told the court that Vogelsang committed the robberies only because he hit rock bottom after suffering a deep depression and unsuccessfully applying to more than 50 jobs. He begged the court for a three-year sentence instead of six, which would be tacked on to his other five-year sentence. White said Vogelsang was depressed and taking ineffective medications, which caused him to make poor decisions. He said Vogelsang didn't have a previous criminal record and conducted every robbery unarmed. 11 people provided character witnesses to the court, some from former students. In an audio clip from jail, Vogelsang apologized to the bank employees he traumatized, the family and friends he embarrassed, and the students he let down. His legendary broadcaster voice was still intact. Vogelsang pleaded guilty. In October 2019, he was sentenced to 18 months for two robberies he committed in Medicine Hat in 2017. This was added on to the previous five-year sentence he received for four robberies he committed in Alberta and Saskatoon. Vogelsang lives in a 9 by 15 foot cell at Drumheller Institution. He started antipsychotic medications and finally started feeling like himself again. Overall, his prison experience hasn't been half bad. Fellow inmates tell him it's cool that an older man had the courage to commit bankruptcy robberies. He's made friends in prison. He's lost weight. And he still exercises every day. He has a job as a painter. His closest friends are around his age, but he spends his lunch hour talking to the younger inmates, hoping to inspire them and give them the attention they so desperately seek. Vogelsang spent his first two years in prison deeply remorseful about what he did, but now he looks back on the career and reputation he completely destroyed and sees it as a unique opportunity to build himself up again from scratch. He knows he will never be able to go back to Winnipeg or Saskatchewan, but he's optimistic. Mystic. He got two prison tattoos to represent the new identity he has taken on as an aging ex-con. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section what you'd rather be, a big fish in a small pond or a small fish in a big pond.